have a resource today from education to resources to finances. She's in the midst of us. She designs resources that teach faith and financial principles. Ministry clients include organizations like Faithful Central Baptist Church of Los Angeles, Spirit of Faith Center of Baltimore, Maryland, West Point Missionary Baptist Church of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Glory Church of Columbia, South Carolina, and others. So can you all agree that we have a gift on this morning? And I want us to welcome this watch. God has freely given to us the gift in the body of author and strategist Stella Payton. Let's thank God for her on today. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pastor Dylan. You know, when I was a little girl in church, I used to want to grow up and be like Pastor Dylan. Because she is so not only articulate, but she is truly a replicable model. See, everybody's life you cannot emulate. And what I admire about this woman of God is that when I do what she does, live how she lives, and act how she acts, God is glorified in my actions because of the model he used to show me. And so that's the new paradigm. Paradigm. How you see, how things are shaped, how things come into existence based on how we think. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you this. You're going to need to get the tape because it's a lot of information. I don't study to teach, I study to learn. And I'm going to teach you out of what God has imparted to me. Because if it's good enough to feed me, it's good enough to feed you. Amen. Y'all ready? Hallelujah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that your word is life. And in Jesus' name, I decree the life of your word breathing into these people today. I thank you that today the life-giving word will transform minds and activate thoughts that create words which inspire actions to change. And with that change, we will be able to receive from the mind of God the thoughts of God so that we can release into the earth the will of God. So that we are no longer hearers of words, but we are doers and we manifest the glory in what we do, who we are, and how we live. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Say this with me. Who can find a virtuous woman? Now close your eyes. Visualize those words. Who can find a virtuous woman? And when you get to who, see who can find a, now picture virtuous. Draw a line through that. Okay. Now open your eyes. Now why did I tell you to draw a line through it? Through virtuous. Let me give you a little bit of history about that word. And about the translation of that word. Who can find the word virtuous is a translation of a Hebrew word called kayil. 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 Kayil is found in the scriptures about 225 times. Of the 225 times it's found in scriptures, it is only translated as virtuous three times. Once in Proverbs 31. Once in Proverbs 4, and once in Ruth, where Boaz was saying to Ruth, everybody, we know you are a virtuous woman, okay? When you find this word in other places, though, it has a totally different connotation. Now, for us in our Western culture, when they translated back in the 16th century, when King James authorized the translators to begin the interpretation and translating these scriptures, what we have to realize, or what most people don't understand is, for the three, almost 300 years prior to that season, there had been something going on in the earth called the Great Crusades. Anybody ever hear about the Crusades? 
where the Europeans, when they left, they're going to go all over the world. The Roman Catholic Church had authorized these soldiers and knights to go, and they're going to convert the whole world, right? And so all of the men from Europe left, and they would be gone for years at a time fighting wars. In addition, women didn't fight. So when they were gone, they came back. They were very concerned about the concept of moral virtue and their women. So when the translators translated that word, what was at the forefront of their mind? Virtue in the context of moral excellence. Okay? Now, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's a foundation. Now, I want you to, some, some things you just assume, right? Like, I don't, have to, I don't have to stop, let's say you're my child. I don't have to assume that you're not going to cuss me out, right? I, I, don't have, I, don't have, I, don't, you know, I don't even have to think, is she going to cuss me out today? It's a given. It's my child. She ain't going to do that. To a Hebrew woman, anything less than moral excellence meant death. You were either burned or stoned. So that level of moral excellence and virtue, that's a given. It was assumed. It's just the way, that's the way, it's the way the culture is. It's just how, that's how they live, that's how they thought. And anything less than that, they took you out. So now understanding that moral excellence, having lives of purity so that you can have access to power, so that we can have access to presence, that's a given. That's why the whole concept of virtue and moral excellence is important because the all, all sin is designed to corrupt the vessel and to prevent the vessel from having access to the mind of God. That's what all sin, anything, any sin, whether it's done to you, whether it's done through you, or whether you commit it to or bring it on yourself. So now we understand moral excellence is a given, right? Say that with me. Moral excellence is a given. Virtue is a given. It's assumed. God ain't saying, are you going to be morally excellent? No, it's assumed. He's assuming you're going to live up to this standard. That's assumed. Why, now, why do we need it? Why is that important? Well, that takes us to the next level. So what, if, that doesn't, if, that's not what, if that's not the full connotation of the word kail, let's talk about the other meanings of kail in the Hebrew. And this is what got me excited when I studied this. Of the 220 sometimes that the word kail is found, three of them are virtue, the about 50% of the times that word is found, it is in the connotation of warrior, warfare. But it's always, almost all the times, it's found with a slant towards assumed victory. It's like, yeah, we're going to fight, but we already in the one. It's like Jehoshaphat, one of, those, one of those accounts is when Jehoshaphat is getting ready to go to battle. And he turns and he says, oh, Lord, you are, you know, and it's like David. David, David says, who is this giant, this Philistine? How dare he stand against the armies of the Almighty God? He said, yeah, look, I took out a bear. I took out a lion. And he's going to be like them. His victory was assumed. It was assumed. Now, hold that thought on David, man of war. Say, David. Man of war. Hold that. Okay. So we know half the time we see Kail. Say the word Kail. 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 Now, I asked, I said, Lord, if I write this book, a Kail woman, ain't nobody going to know what that means. And he said, yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem. So that once you understand that your victory has already, in any area, in any situation, in any circumstances, has already been established, it is, it is already assumed. So what we have to figure out is where in between the assumption of my victory and the manifestation of my victory, what is between the two? And what is stopping the assumption from God from, and the, reaching the manifestation for me? See, I like shouting, I like dancing, but I want manifestation. I want to know what can I do to make this manifest. Now, if it's something I can do on my end, I know God has done some things to empower me. But I want to know what can I do on my end. Because see, in some sense, God has done everything that he can do. Jesus going to the cross, he can't do anymore. He had no more blood to shed. 
So what's the difference? So now we understand that the word kail, 50% of the time, it relates to the concept of victorious warfare. It gets better. About another 25% of the time, it relates to the connotation of wealth. Deuteronomy 8.18, it is the Lord who gives us power to get Kail that we may establish his covenant in the earth. It is the Lord who gives us power to get wealth that we may establish his covenant in the earth. You see the difference? So now, when he said, who can find a virtuous warrior woman who knows how to handle money so that she can take forth possession of what God wants to release in the earth? Warrior, wealthy, warrior, woman of valor. Now, say this word with me. Say this. Say, eshet, kail. Eshet, kail. Eshet Kail is virtuous woman. Now the word Eshet is woman and Kail is virtuous. When you translate Eshet Kail, it translates into woman of valor. Now let's look at the contrast between woman of value, valor and woman of virtue. Now we know what virtue is. We've been studying that for decades. Let's focus on woman of valor. When you say the word valor, it has about seven, eight, nine connotations. And I love this. I love words. I've been a word freak most of my life. Because words create. And the more refined, the more detailed words you use to construct something, the better details you have in the plans of the building of your life. Okay? Eshet Kail, woman of valor. Valor, the first meaning of valor is to have great courage in the face of danger, especially in battle. Now, who's got a fight? Anybody got a fight going on in their life right now? A a health fight? Up right here, I saw a hand. You got a fight? Do you you mind sharing? Can you you share what that is? If you you don't want to. Who, Who has a fight that they can share? Yes, sir. A spiritual fight. Taking the concept of a spiritual fight, knowing that when you are in a fight, the word of God says the enemy comes but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So when you talk about a spiritual fight, then you have an enemy who is determined to destroy your spiritual man, separate you from your eternal destiny, and to cause you to not go and to spend eternity with God. He wants to destroy you, tear up your soul, tear up your ability to access God so he can cause you to think thoughts that separate you from the kingdom and cause you to end up in hell. That's a spiritual fight, right? Well, one of the beautiful things about the word valor is that when you look at the concept of valor, it means to have courage. That's the ability to stand up in the middle of the fight. In the middle of the fight. I watched the movie Pompeii the other night. And then, I don't know if anybody saw it. You know, remember the black guy? And he knew that he was at the end. He stood up and he says, to those who are about to die, I salute you. Well, I like that. Because you know why? Because Paul said, I die daily. So when the enemy comes to attack your spirit man, say to your flesh, to those who are about to die, to the flesh of my emotions, yes, I've got some difficulty going on, but I'm going to kill my flesh, and I'm going to say some things that are going to make me enter into a place of victory. I'm going to say, in the name of Jesus, this book of the law shall not depart out of my mouth, but I shall dwell in it and abide in it and study it day and night that I may observe. Observe means to look for ways to do it, to find, think about ways to do it, to figure out how do I do this word. Lord, this book of the law shall not depart out of my mouth. Then I shall make, I, I make my way prosperous. I, and then once I make my way prosperous, success is assumed. Success is assumed. 
When you make your way prosperous, when you take the word and use the word as the forefront for what you will do and how you live and how we think, how we think. Now, we, so we see Eshet Kayil, the woman of valor. We see it, that she is courage in the face of danger. But it gets better. It implies bravery and courage, doing what frightens you. For the Lord has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. A year ago, about a year ago, September, I got a call. I was about to take a flight to go speak at a conference somewhere in South Carolina. And they called me and told me my sister had had a massive aneurysm. She had had a bisection aneurysm. And I don't know if you know what that means, but that means the aorta going into her heart exploded and ripped like a zipper unzips. And it was, and she had had the aneurysm four hours earlier, and her heart had been pumping blood into her body for four hours. And the people in the emergency room didn't give her the right test. And if it wasn't for my cousin saying, This hospital is crazy, we're gonna drive you to Little Rock. So he drove her an hour and a half to another city. I got this phone call. And the first thing the enemy says, she going to die. I said, in the name of Jesus, I decree that Janice Payton shall live and not die to declare the works of the Lord. In the face of fear, woman of valor, she stands in the face of fear. Okay? Not, 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 ain't nothing wrong with virtue. But how many of you got some situations like me that that scare you? It's okay to get scared. It's what you do with your fear that matters. Are you going to let your fear cause you to cower and go crawl under a fence, under a, under a, under a bed somewhere, cover your head and cry? Or are you going to stand up and say, you know what? I know the enemy says that I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to be able to do this. But in the name of Jesus, I'm going to get up. I'm going to pull myself together. And I'm going to go and I'm going to do what God told me to do. And I'm going to assume that he will be there when I arrive. Success is assumed. It's assumed. It gets better. Valor, woman of valor, eshet kayil, means to pluck. I love this word, pluck. I thought pluck meant just picking something up, but it, it means valor. It means the kind of daring that enables you to quickly remove someone from a dangerous or unpleasant situation. Let me give you an example of the power of an eshet kayil. You're driving down the freeway. You see a man on the side of the road uh, fixing his car. He's laying down on the ground fixing his car. And people drive by and say, oh, that man, somebody's going to run through here and hit him. That's death. And Eshet Kail will say, in the name of Jesus, I release the host of angels. Angels, go stand and guard that man. Protect him around that car. In Jesus' name, I decree nobody will hit him. And while you at it, Father, reveal yourself to him under that car. Show him who you are. Give him a vision of Jesus. Minister to his imagination the power of God. And Lord, explode your presence upon the scene of his life. See, everything, nothing leaves heaven until a declaration leaves earth. What you declare, what you decree, what you speak, what we say, what we speak, what we say, what we speak. We are building the blocks of our world. Eshet Kail. Eshet Kail is a woman with nerve. She got some nerve. She is braced mentally to face demanding situations. Girl is bad. Oh, you, you, you're not going to get that job. Watch me. The word of God says, whatsoever I ask. If I'm porish in the house, better than that. Thank you, Holy Ghost. It gets better than that. Mm. Ha ha. Thank you, Jesus. Ah, Eshet Kail. We have a propensity that when we were wanting something from God, we ask God. We say, Lord, I need a new job. 
In John 15, 16, it says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. That mm, Say that. Bring forth, bring forth. Fruit. fruit. I have been ordained to bring forth fruit. My life is supposed to manifest things. My life is supposed to produce some things. It says, and that your fruit should remain. Say, my fruit stays. That whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he may, say this word, give it you. Now, the assumption in those three words, give it you, is that if I ask God for a new job, God is going to give the job to me. But I am a creator. Back in Genesis, when God said he made Adam and he would bring things, he said, Adam, look, I got all this stuff I made. Name that stuff. Adam goes, sweet, I got you, God. And Adam began to call it what it was. He described each animal after its own nature and assigned a title to it. He decided, based on what it should look look like, his own imaginative thoughts, his own intuition, he gave them labels as far as what they should do, be, and how they flow through the earth. So when the word of God says, when the prophet said there, give it you, He wasn't saying God is going to give you a job. What he was saying is, I am going to give you to the job because you are a speaking spirit who has the authority to call that job what it's supposed to be. So instead of saying, I want a job, uh, God give me a job, God has said, well, speaking spirit, create what you want with your words. Well, Instead of just saying, well, look, what do I want? No, I don't really, I don't want, I don't want a job. Job means working for somebody just as broke. So here's what I decree. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for a position that teaches me how to manage finances, investments, and all of the, stru- the, the financial infrastructure so that I can learn how to have the financial infrastructure to build wealth for the rest of my life. So that the money that I create in my lifetime will live five generations after me. I'm a speaking spirit. And wealth, on average, when it's wealth, lives at least five generations after you. And so I, dec- I don't just want a job. I want an avenue that allows me to create cash flow as a base. Because your job is your first income stream. See, when you look at the people, when you look at, uh, uh, when you look at Moses, when you look at Joseph, when you look at Abraham, when you look at Isaac, when you look at all of these men and the, these great men and women of the, of the word, they had multiple streams of income. Moses had cattle and sheep. He had camels and land. He had crops, okay, and servants. Multiple. Now that's just six streams of income. So if all you have is a job, you will never have access to wealth. You will never have access to the lifestyle of a eshet kail. So God is saying to you, see, I know I can, I can get up. I don't want to hype you. I want you to understand that there are multiple streams in you. And your emotions will not give you access to them. You can get excited and holler and shout all day long. But until you understand, I have to pull myself together. I have to think with my mind, what do I want? If you ask the average person, if I gave you a million dollars, what would you do? And they'll say things like, girl, I'm, I'll go pay my mama house off. I'll go buy me a new house. I'm going to get me a car. I'm going to pay some bills. Oh, and I'm going to give some money to the church. And it's like, ah, wrong answer. All wrong answers. Because lump sums of money are designed as they are a gift to you and an invitation to create wealth that lives beyond your lifetime. Do you know if you took a million dollars and you placed it in a mutual fund 
at about 12% interest. It will gen and you just left it there. If you put it there in 2001 and then that money started to grow and it started to mature, you could suck off $5,000 a month and never touch the principal. In fact, by the time you died, if you lived 30 years, it would have tripled three times. And that's just one million. So you get to have $5,000 a month in income and you leave your children $3 million when you go. But if you buy the house for your mom, you buy the house for yourself, you have just bought two depreciating assets that now are sucking money out of you that you got to pay for for the rest of your life. See? Let's talk a little bit more about Eshet A few more things about her because I'm running out of time. I know. Tell, you have to let me know when, I'm, when my time is up. It's, I, I could go on, but I know my time is limited. <sighs> Eshet Kayil. She had nerd. Another thing about her was she was audacious. She took bold risk with confidence. She just bad enough to think, if I go before this king, I know he's going to say he ain't going to get, I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna go before this king and I'm going to keep worrying him until he said, go on, give her what she want. Okay. I'm going to go back to this small business administration and I'm going to fill out an application every 30 days and tell it to me, yes. I had a guy who told me, he, uh, I, I was actually reading about him rather, he was saying that there was a company that he wanted to work for and he interviewed and they told him, you're not qualified for this job. And he says, oh yes I am. What are the qualifications? The guy told him the qualifications. So he went back and qual requalified -qual himself. He went and shaped himself to match all the qualifications. Then he went back and interviewed again. And the guy said, well you can't have this job. He said, well why not? He said, because you, well, you had a qualification but you don't have any experience. He said, well, what do I need to do? Do we need this much? He said, okay, well hold on. He goes back, works for somebody else for X amount of time, gets some experience it comes back. And the guy said, look, man, I'm going to just give you this job because you're going to worry me to death. <laughs> now, let's talk a little bit about paradigms in the context of transforming negative things. I love what she, her testimony last night where she was talking about how God can take a negative circumstance and create positive. As a speaking spirit, say, I am, I am. a speaking spirit. I have the authority. I have the ability to call it what it's supposed to be. You don't have to call it what it is. You call it what it's supposed to be. Who decides what it's supposed to be? You do. So let's just say, some, I'll give you an example. I'll use myself as an example. I had a client that has fed me so well since 1998. I mean, systematically. I would go, I would work five to seven days. I fly up there, I work for them for a week, make five to seven grand, come home. I would do that three or four times a year. Some years I did it six times a year. Just go work a week and come home. The first part of this year, they told me, we're going to, we got to cut back. I was like, and, and I was the one who told them they had to cut back. You know, that's my job. And I knew that. I knew that. So I'm not going to tell my client, well, this is what you need to do, but you got to keep me. No. I said, no, this is what you need to do. And I understand that I am an expense that has to be reflected in this instruction. That's my job. I'm a strategist. I'm a business strategist. I'm not going to lie to my client and tell him to keep me paying me money that I know he can't afford right now. So I've got to tell. So I told my client what he had to do, and I was a part of the cut. So from February till now, I didn't have any, I was like, God, what am I going to do? And so I was trying to think of all of these things that I wanted to do. I was thinking of all these things that I wanted to do. Remember, you call it not what it is. You call it what you want it to be. And so I began to say, I said, okay, Lord. And so I started. I had one project that I loved. I, I tried to do it. That didn't work. And then back a year and a half ago, the Lord gave me this word about Caillou. In fact, in my book that's out there on the table right now, the one, Accessing the Windows of Heaven, the Lord gave me the revelation and the insight about Jehovah Kail, the Lord of Wealth, Deuteronomy 8.18. It is the Lord who gives us power. That whole, see, preshino, that whole word power, power has nine elements in it. He gives you nine resources to build wealth. And when you understand how to access the resources, everything you need is on the other side of the relationship. But we have this thing, we walk by people and don't talk to them because they don't look like us. Mm. 
I'm going to get there. But anyway, so I'm back. Here I am trying to figure out, God, where am I? And so I had this idea. And so finally I said, well, I ain't got nothing else to do. Let me just go home and work on some of these books. Mm. From February till 10 days ago, I finished one. I, fin- I, I refined one. Pulled another. This one is 90% done. Jehovah Kyle, I'm actually cleaning it up. I've got another one that I pulled off the shelf and got, and then the Lord gave me the idea for what to put in it. I have three books in six months. What I thought was a layoff was God positioning me for four additional streams of income. See? What you call it? What are you going to call it? What are you going to call your disadvantage? What are you going to call the issue? The Chinese have a symbol. You see that little black circle and then that little white circle is called yin, yang. It's, it is a comp- it's, and it means order versus chaos. It means on the o- other side of all chaotic situations, there is an opportunity in it. Well, the word of God, that, 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 uh, Napoleon Hill called it the seed of equivalent benefit. The seed of equivalent benefit says that it... When something is awful that happens in my life, to the depth that it drags me down and tries to destroy me, the seed of equivalent benefit says that the law of opposites command that I have equal victory that matches it in height and success. So when the enemy tries to take you out, you know that you've got some serious living coming on the other side of it. When the enemy tries to rob your finances, like Job, you know, on the other side of it, you got more, you're gonna, he's going to double it. Whatever. So the law, the seed of equivalent benefit says that it has to manifest. A couple more and then I'll be done. Kaya was stout-hearted. That's having a spirit, a courageous spirit. People say to me all the time, is he always so happy? I say, that's because I realize that my persona is a... Now, for the, now don't, I don't want y'all to think I'm, I'm new age. Because a lot of people hear stuff and they say, ooh, that's all that new age stuff. When they don't realize it's scientific. And anything scientific, if it's truly scientific, can be proven and it can be validated with the word of God. If it cannot be validated with the word of God, then it's truly not. It's not really scientific. It's all science can be validated. Okay. So we have this concept, this principle of, or they call it, and the people in the new age call it or. But actually what it is, is thought energy. Thought is energy. When a person is in a hospital, they have a bad car accident, and they stay laid out. When they take them to the hospital to determine whether they're dead or not, what do they do? They hook their body up to a, to a I don't know if it's an EKG or whatever, but they put it to a machine to see if their brain is generating electrical impulses. All thought sends out electrical impulses. See, that's why when God said, let the weak say I'm strong. Because if I just allow my energy, my weak energy to speak for me, what I send out, I attract. But speech supersedes emotion. The highest form of creation is the spoken word. So when I say I'm strong, my emotions must conform to my speech. What happens with most of us is we let our emotions tell us how to think. Some of y'all will remember this music. Boom. Boom, 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 boom. When you heard that, what images came to your mind? Remember that? Skin tight, the bump, right? Okay, I'll give you another one. What's the what's the new one? The the uh the line dance that everybody does. Yeah, anyone? Yeah, electric slide. How does it how does it sound? When you hear it, what do you want to do? I'm going to give you a paradigm. When you hear this, what are your emotions programmed to do? 
What are your emotions programmed to do? Jump up and shout. What's the difference? What's the difference? See, what we have to understand, Krish and the Mool say, this in this era, it's okay to get excited and to shout, you have all that stuff. But if you want, see, Krish in the Saka, the word of God says that, oh, God, help me, Holy Ghost, it's so fast. Ah, the passage that says, the Lord, my God, shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. Glory, glory. Notice it did not say heaven. Heaven is fixed. Glory is movable. I, which means, now let's go to Isaiah 60, verse, it says, Arise, shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Now, notice it says risen and upon. It means it comes up out of you and it connects with the power that's over you. Look at that holy shield. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. Now, who is the door? I'm the door. So it says the glory of the Lord is risen. So don't stand up. Up on you. Now, boom, once you stand up, bam, the glory connects. And so now, if I understand, once I am in that glory, my mind has to do some things. You can't be in the glory with your mind doing all kind of crazy stuff. See, this is, why, this is why in this era, you can't fake this move. This is what God is doing now. You can't fake it. You can only produce it can accrescimo. What will come out of you is what is in you already. And so the Lord and I have an agreement. I told God, look, I ain't talking about nothing that you ain't proved to me. And I had an issue in my life. And I had heard a message about this very principle. And I said, God, I need you to prove this to me. I need you to show me. And it may, that makes sense. That the scripture validates it. But who said, what did we say earlier? We want what? Manifestation. I don't want to have information that gives me revelation. And we, most of the time in the church, we take revelation. And we, it's like, it's like I see the exit sign. And I run over there and I grab the exit sign off the wall and I go, I can go out. I can go out. I can go out. That's what it's like when you have revelation with no manifestation. And so we in the church, all over the kingdom, just in the church, jumping around with the exit signs in our hands. And God is saying, baby, the sign is pointing you to where to go to get the manifestation. So I had this issue, and I began to pray. And, and as I have, I, I begin to pray, and I heard this tape, just almost somebody, she said, now when you begin to worship God, she said, don't just worship with your mind going all over the place. Somebody give me a napkin or something, because I'm going to melt up here. She said, uh, you don't just, don't let your mind go all over the, when the word of God says, thank you, I will worship the Lord with all of my heart. Heart is the center of a man. So that means when I worship him. And I'm not talking about what we're doing here in church. I'm talking about what you do at home, in your bedroom, when ain't nobody else in there but you. I will worship him with all of my heart, with all of my soul, and with all of my mind. Now, my soul is my mind, what I think, my will, what I do, and my emotions, what I feel. Most people lead with number three as opposed to leading with number one. The heart, which is the center of the man, is the part of you that points you in the direction of God or points you in the direction of your affections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people's affections are towards God. So the heart points you into the, in the direction of what you're after. Remember the word says, where your treasures are, that will your heart be also? Your heart points you in the direction of your affections. Yeah. So whatever your, whatever your true affections are, your heart is pointing it. And then one thing about that, when your heart points that your money follows. Okay? 
So now I'm going, I'm in this atmosphere. I'm like, God, teach me how this works. I got this issue. And so I'm in, I'm in, my, in this atmosphere. And I just begin to enter, just begin to worship. In my bedroom, nobody ever me. Music, soft music going on. I'm just going, and then I heard the instructions the lady had given on the table. She said, now begin to focus your thoughts. Begin to aim your mind intentionally upon God. And I begin to, and it's not easy. Because as soon as I would start thinking, God, I thank you. In my mind, Lord, I bless you. I praise you. Girl, you need to go wash them dishes downstairs. That kitchen is a mess. Oh, Lord, I thank you. Then you, pull, you catch your mind, you pull it back. Now, let me give you a picture. Let me give you a picture. Now, remember what we just said. We just said, we're talking about opening, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, everlasting doors. We're talking about creating an open gateway so that you have access, so that you can create the realm of glory wherever you are. Remember, heaven is fixed, glory is movable. Heaven, say it, heaven is fixed, glory is movable. You can move the glory from place to place. Lift up your heads, O your gates, be ye lifted up your everlasting doors. Arise, shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon. It rises up out of you, and then it comes down upon you. So when we activate certain things where we begin to activate the glory in you, oh, for Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, the only way most people will have access to the glory that's going to cover the whole earth is the glory in you has got to rise up, connect with the glory that's coming down so that it can begin to flow out. And that's how the glory is going to cover the earth. So I begin to get my mind. Say here, I will bless you, Father. I will meditate upon you. I will focus my thoughts. This, and then he would give me a thought about the situation. This ain't going to happen. Oh, the devil is a lie. Thank you, Father. I will not focus my thoughts on him. He doesn't deserve my thought energy. I focus on you. I will meditate on you. As soon as I did that for a few minutes, all of a sudden, I started losing track of time. And in my room, it wasn't a bit, it wasn't tangible, wasn't nothing, nothing in there. But I had an image in my head. Your imagination is given to you to create. It is an opportunity for you to see. It is a tool to see what you can do in the earth, what can manifest through you, what you have the capacity to release. If you can see it, that means everything necessary to create it is already here. But it's up to you to go find the pieces of the puzzle, put them together, and make it so. And as I was, min as I was ministering to God, there came a moment when I saw I an image. And I began to pray over this image and pray over this image and pray. And then this image started to do things. And then the image vanquished. And you know that issue I was dealing with? Starting the next day, it was gone. It was gone. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, that's good. Give me some scriptures. And the Lord, the idea, the concept was it had melted away. And the Lord said, go to Exodus 15, 15. And in Exodus 15, it says, and the men of Canaan, something, 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 shall melt away. I hollered. That's when I started shouting and running around my room. Yeah, because I had the victory. And the last thing I'm going to tell, um, am I out of time? Okay, all right. If you guys get tired, just say, we tired, we got enough. In fact, everybody stand up. Pick up, pick up your belongings and switch and move to a different spot in the room. Stay in the, top, in the front four rows. If you're in the back, come on, come forward. Uh, and don't, please don't go past the fourth, the fourth row. I'm going to count to ten. By the time I get to ten, you should be in a different spot. Stay on this side. Stay on this side. Stay, on, stay in the same section. Just move to a different spot. Stay close to me. The reason I'm telling you this is because, remember, the, when a person is ministering to you, they are releasing energy. The farther you are away, the more it takes, it pulls more out of you. So if you just stay real, real close, I can get, it gets more concentrated. Does that make sense? All right. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. I always tell people it's important to change your location. 
Because anytime you want to activate movement in your life, you can do one or, th one or all three things. The first thing you will have to always do is change your information. If what you, is it happening in your life, you're feeling good and you're not excited about it, you need to change your information, number one. Number two, you need to change your relationships. God will always, whenever he gets ready to take you into a whole new area, he will introduce new people into your life who can escort you into the next level of your destiny. And the third thing he will do is he will change your location. He'll make you move. Why? Because when you are fixed in a certain location, atrophy, mental atrophy sets in and you can't move. And just like if I don't use this arm, if I hold this arm next to my body like this, when I don't move, my mind becomes atrophied into that location. And then I, there, are certain, there's, there are certain things that can never manifest out of me. Hallelujah. So now we see, let's, let's summarize what we've been talking about so far. We started out this morning talking about eshet kayo. Say the word, eshet kayo. Make this declaration. I am, I am a Kail woman. woman. I have the capacity, have the capacity of Eshet Kail. I am a woman of valor. I am, valor. I am daring. I, am daring. I, have I have great courage in the face of fear. I am brave. I, am brave. I do what frightens me. For the Lord has not given me a spirit of fear. I pluck. I, 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 am, I have the ability to remove someone from dangerous and unpleasant situations. Now let me tell you this right now. It is important that we understand the best experience you can have is the experience that someone else got and you learn from their example. Experience teaching you is not always the best thing. So what I, the reason I say that is because when God, God wants to always, the word of God says, he told Abraham, I will do nothing unless I share this with my prophets. Every one of us is a prophet. We all, in other words, we all have the ability to access a prophetic anointing. It is a part of the spiritual gifts. But like all gifts, if it is undeveloped and uncultivated, it will not be utilized and it cannot benefit you. In fact, I tell people all the time, if you say, oh, well, you don't feel bad. They won't let me preach. They won't let me minister. They won't let, they won't let me prophesy. Well, go prophesy to somebody on the streets. And then I was, I'm going to give you an example. You're a speaking spirit. Remember, I am a speaking spirit. A guy pulled up. To, I was at the gas station the other day coming home. And he pulled. He said, uh, I, he, he said hey, lady. And I was cute. I ain't going to say I was cute. He said, uh, he said uh, hey, lady. He said, um, he said uh, I, I know I should, probably shouldn't ask you. He said, but you married, right? I said, yeah, 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 I am. I said, but you know what? Since I got your attention, I've always believed that my beauty is a tool that God gave me <laughs> to get attention. I said, can I minister to you and just pray for you real quick? And he was sitting in his car. And I just reached my hand in the car. I said, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I release your anointing into this man's life. I decree in Jesus' name over the next seven days, you're going to reveal yourself to him. He's going to start having dreams about his destiny in God. Well, what does it say in the book of Joel? I'm not lying, because what does it say in Joel? And in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and my sons and my daughters will prophesy. Well, the only difference, you know, he, he don't, people say, well, you don't know if he was born again. Or not. I said, yes, I do. How do you know? Because I have already decreed any man, woman, or child who comes under the sound of my voice, I decree they will not go into hell, but I claim that soul as my inheritance and my possession, and they belong to me because I belong to God. My thoughts are in agreement with what God said. Why? Because it says the Lord of God says, it is the Lord's will that none should perish, but that all should come into the knowledge of repentance. So I just say, so in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Father, for causing this young man to come into the knowledge of repentance. <laughs> See, when you make the declaration, it is not your responsibility to produce the manifestation. It's your responsibility to declare it 
And then the more what happens is the more you, and people say, they say, they say you, you think you all of that. I am. I am. Because like the Kaya woman. Now, see, I just talked about the definition. I just told you the definition, the difference between virtuous and eshet Kaya. I ain't even touched. The, the verses from verse 10 to 31. I ain't even look. I ain't even talk. Golly. I, I just told. That's just. So now do you see this capacity that we have? When people tell you, say, we need to renew our minds. They say, you just need to renew your mind. What the assumption is, is that you need to memorize some scriptures so you can recant them. What they don't understand is that your mind has six faculties. So when they say renew your mind, they don't realize that there are six components of your mind that have to be realigned and that different things you need to do with each one. And it's what's wonderful about it is God weaved it so that if you start doing certain things with one, it'll cause the others to kind of come into alignment. I guess just give you one. One of the faculties of the mind... It's perception. It's how I see. Now, when you were sitting, listen, where did you, where did you move from? You moved from, you, let's see, who, who moved, who, to, who took a long leap? Who moved? Yeah. You were all the way back there, and you came up here. How did your perception change once you relocated? Not only can you hear me better, but now you have access to me. See? Perception defines what you have access to. How you see stuff tells you what you can get. Now, let me break it down. Little girl, mother's colorblind. She buys her a dress for school. Little dress, pretty little red dress, but the mother is colorblind. She sees red as blue. And so the mother sees the little dress, which is, but the mother sees it as, her perception is but the color is, you a fool. You ain't going to never be nothing. When well, actuality, you have an IQ of 156. You just don't know it. You ain't going nowhere. You're going to be just like your daddy. Perception. Reality. What we say about ourselves is based on what we've heard about ourselves. And then we, what we hear we don't, we don't understand. We are rehearsing old tapes. So you can fake this, but your life will manifest what's in your mind. And God has made it so that in this hour, you must gird up the loins of your mind. You can shout. You can run from here to there. You can do backflips all the way back. But at the end of the day, you will have to learn to walk by faith. You will have to learn to gird up the loins of your mind. You will have to learn in the name of Jesus, I will be transformed by the renewing of my mind. See, see, ah, and that's how I can keep from being conformed to this world. See, if our kids knew, if a child learns, if a child learns that, you know, if they see a weak gospel, then they don't want to replicate that. But if they realize that they can go to school and they can lay, like we were at the last service I did, a little girl, the Lord gave me this thing about bullying. I told a little girl, come on, I said, from now on in the name of Jesus, the next time the bully comes to you, you say, in the name of Jesus, I command you, leave me alone. My son, when he was a little guy, I said, if anybody ever tries to catch you, touch you, you start saying, Jesus, Jesus, Je-. this, is why you're, this is where your emotions come in. Yeah. See, when you just say, Jesus, 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 when you activate your emotions, your emotions gives you more force and more power, which allows you to, the glory to come up. So the glory can come down. You create the glory realm in your, in your presence. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is And at the same time, what's happening in your mind? You can't be saying, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you're not going to mess with me, you're not going to mess with me, you're not going to mess with me. 
If you're feeling fear and saying faith, it's not going to work. That's why you have to renew your mind in advance. That's why you have to make sure that the word is in you in abundance in advance. That's why you have to teach your kids like my mama taught us to say it in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father, according to the words of Psalms 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him do I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. I live and walk in divine health. Sickness and the disease has no place in my body. Now, the last thing I'm going to tell you, on that note, I got up yesterday afternoon. And right before I came here, I had this, I was hot. I had a hundred plus temperature. And the enemy said, you're getting sick. I said, oh, I praise you, Father, that I live and walk in divine health. I thank you. I stopped the thought in its track with the confession. And then I didn't allow myself to start acting like I wasn't feeling good. I got myself up. I went. I prayed over myself. I drank me some water, got me a snack, started moving around, doing stuff around my house that I needed to do, got dressed, came to church, had a good time. And I said, now, Father, I praise you. When I wake up in the morning, I will be free and rested and ready to give what you have given me. Here I is. (laughs) See? Symptoms lie. Facts are not the same as truth. It was a fact that I had a hundred plus temperature. But the truth was, Jesus himself bore sickness and disease for me in his own body. And with his stripes, I was healed over 2,000 years ago. Now, if I can do that with a cold, if it'll work with a cold, like it worked with a lion, it'll work with Ebola. If it'll work with a tiger or a bear, It'll work with whatever. But if you don't practice it on the cold, (laughs) Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you have given me this morning. I praise you for your people. I decree in Jesus' name that these words have fallen upon good ground, that these words will be re- Canted in their imaginations and in their thoughts, that they will hear these words and they will bring them to mind. And as they pick up their Bibles, these words will connect with the word that they see and they study, and it will give increased wisdom and insight in how to apply it so that they go from information to revelation, to manifestation in Jesus' name. Praise you, Father.